I am going to share some of the findings from an exploratory study that Jeff Huang and I conducted on spectatorship and games. When you look at a picture like this, you realize the interaction isn't just about a person and a game. There's a lot of people behind the game, people standing behind you on a couch in a living room or over the internet engaged in this larger activity. This motivated Jeff and myself to ask, who are these people? Why do they spectate? How do different stakeholders affect the spectatorship? What is it about the design of the game that makes spectating a game enjoyable? We picked a highly spectated game called StarCraft. It's a game where players marshal a growing set of buildings and units, and they try to throw them at each other. And a spectator has the privilege of panning around the game, seeing the game action from another perspective. So what we did is we collected uh, online self-reports about spectating. We chose about 127 instances to analyze for spectating themes, and we picked out categories. What I'm going to do is jump to the last question and ask, uh, what makes StarCraft enjoyable to watch? From the data, we got a lot of answers. Kind of the ones that you expect would be classic. There's an engaging narrative. There are some really good graphics. These star players are really funny or interesting personalities, right? There are these celebrities out there. But one that kind of jumped out as, as really interesting in terms of how the game is designed was one that we called information asymmetry. This term is meant to talk about the imbalance of information between the player and the spectator, where due to the way the game is designed, only one party is privy to the information and the other one is not. So in StarCraft, the information that players get that no one else gets would be the choice of strategy, awareness of your own army and your own buildings, and the spectators, as someone watching from the outside, what you're left with is access to seeing everything that everyone does potentially. Uh, you have access to the entire map and the way the game is designed in a lot of spectating situations standing at home watching a streaming video so you can only see what the cameraman decides to show you. That's actually a really interesting phenomenon. We pushed out at the end of this paper this assertion. We say enjoyable tension in games can be created by situations where information asymmetry exists. Let's walk through some quick examples of that. Let's say stuff that the player knows and stuff that the spectators do not know. Since the buildings that you build dictate the kind of units that you can have in the middle of a game, what a lot of players have is a build order, a plan for how they're going to unfold their entire strategy. This kind of information is actually really, really interesting to spectators who are watching the game within the first two to three minutes of the game. When you're watching a recording of people watching a game of StarCraft, you'll hear the audience go crazy when the player decides to build one building. I mean, for someone from our perspective, sometimes we don't understand what that means, but that spills out to an entire tree of possibilities. And so you can see a, a huge amount of tension surrounding the first couple minutes of a game. Other ones are your choice of attack strategy, what's your strategy for going th throughout the game, and you can see that unfold as a person plays. You have unknowns and unknowns. There's something called fog of war in StarCraft. If I am a player, I can only see on the map whatever my units see. If you have two players, you have different amounts of knowledge about the entire game map. And if you're a spectator, you're given the privy of access Accessing everything. You can see where this person's army is, where per that person is not. And strategies and traps that players are trying to set, sneak attacks that people are trying to achieve, become really interesting because as a spectator, you begin to ask, does player one really know that player two is sneaking around the back over here or has set up a whole bunch of traps under the ground on this certain area? Again, it's another situation that invites audiences to get wrapped up in a sense of tension, a sense of risk and payoff. And so this is another place where there's a lot of excitement about a unit walking by another unit. It doesn't sound that exciting, but all the potential and all the unknowns pull everyone in. You have unknowns and unknowns. No one really knows what's going to happen. The player doesn't know the outcome of the battle, and neither do the spectators. One example of that is in StarCraft 1, there was a unit called a Reaver. And this is just a giant tank that launches little bombs that go out there. The trick about those bombs are that they sometimes go off, they sometimes don't. The AI was so quirky that you would have this moment where you don't know if this is going to wipe out 80% of this person's army or workers or do nothing at all. So it's something to think about in terms of designing for engagement. It's not just about a narrative, not just about designing something visually cool, but also considering the way the game plays, it pulls people into it. A lot of people say, if I'm watching a game, I want to know everything that's going on. Usually that makes a lot of sense. If you're sitting on the corner and you can only see the cars whizzing by in a racetrack, you want to know where they are throughout the race. But what we're, we'd like to push here is to say, well, instead of saying, what if we give more information to spectators? You know, we start asking how spectators can participate in and co-construct their own experience as a body of viewers. And the alternate question we would put in front of people who talk about games or game design or design technologies for spectatorship is to say, actually, where should we place the control of the game information? 
Should it be in the player's hands, in the camera guy's hands, in your own spectator's hands? Do you want to know for yourself that this match is a 10 minute match or would you rather not know how long the match is? You start watching a game and you realize this thing's going to last two minutes. You're already anticipating how the game's going to play out. Now, kind of a quick step backwards to the types of spectators we caught. I invite you to take a look at this list and start thinking of who's doing the work in making a game interesting to watch. Who's doing the work in making it worth your time to dig into. These are the types of spectators that we picked up on and that we caught early on in our process that informed this final finding that I gave you just now. The curious, the person who wants to learn more about the game. Uh, the pupil, the person who's curious but he's doing this because I want to become a player myself. You're watching games specifically because you want to become a better player. The inspired, the people who just want a reason to play, right? You watch enough games and you say, I want to go in and, and take over the world myself. The unsatisfied, watching is actually not what you really want to be doing, but there's only one computer in the house. The entertained, I'm fine, I don't need to play, I'm, I'm having a good time. The assistant, <laughs> you forgot a drone, or, or that's not how you're supposed to beat that boss. The commentator has a lot to explain about the game. There are a lot of formal places where this happens. Think about sports, think about esports, but also think about your friend who's explaining everything about the game sitting next to you. And then specific to StarCraft, we have the observer camera guy. This is a person who has control over what everyone can see and decides for you what's worth watching in the game. Pulling all these people together, you actually have a huge crowd, a community of spectators. When, you, when I say the word roar of the crowd, you get what I mean and what this implies. And so my closing bits here are, there's work involved in spectating. There's the player who actually decides, I'm going to choose a very flashy way of playing to entertain you guys. I'm going to try something risky. I'm going to try something amusing. Someone who says, just wait, wait till you see me do this. You have the observer camera guy, which depends on the game. But in this situation, this is the person who decides what you get to see, what you don't get to see. You have the, the commentator. StarCraft is a game where there are a lot of informal commentating. People will take a game pre-recorded, then record their own audio over and put it on the internet. You can see a sense of pulling people into a narrative or into involved into a game all by the force of that person's personality. Even the spectator himself, you're the one who decides to kind of try not to pay attention to the spoilers in the game. You're the one who decides to not find out stuff until you want to have that experience. I'm going to close with this quote which kind of catches the observer point of view. Korean observers or camera men are much better at making the spectating of StarCraft II more exciting. And he points to a game. That was a great choice not to show TLO, this player's tanks, at the back door and finally show it just as the roaches get into range. I've seen a lot of this kind of stuff in Korean matches where someone is setting up an ambush or building lots of a surprise unit and the observer focuses on other parts of the map and then shows that stuff at the last minute to everyone's surprise. In this case, again, who is the performer? Not exactly the player. And this is actually stuff that's begun to pop up in my own study of board games and work in board games too, that there's a lot of performance in, in gameplay. And it happens in that moment when everyone decides to calculate the score of a game, or that moment when uh, it's not your turn, but it's someone else's turn in a board game. And the moves that you take are really done so that everyone else can see you do that move. And so that's something that's interesting because it stretches into a game and it pulls out towards you know, this wider scope of spectating a larger community around a game.